Ah, New York City. The biggest city in the world. The only place where you can get a freaking nice slice of pizza around here. Now, I know what you're thinking. New York City sounds great. I'm gonna go ahead and move my entire family there right away. However, it's by no means perfect. And there's no place more emblematic of New York City's shifty nature than Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards is a brand new upper-class real estate development in the neighborhood of the same name. Hudson Yards, the neighborhood, was carved out of Hell's Kitchen, which was formerly one of the poorest neighborhoods in Manhattan. Fancy ones. L'Oreal, Warner Media, which owns CNN and HBO, and Intercept Pharmaceuticals, which was sued in 2018 after 19 people died from its $7,000 a month liver drug, Akaliva. By the way, you can live in Hudson Yards too if you're so inclined to pay $2,300 for every square foot of living space. There's also a mall. And this. We'll get to that later. Hudson Yards grand opening was held on March 16th, 2019, and I had the privilege of visiting all the opening day festivities. But before I can tell you how good the Shake Shack was, we need to start all the way back at the turn of the 20th century, when Hell's Kitchen, the neighborhood surrounding Hudson Yards' shiny new buildings, was known as the most dangerous place on the American continent. Regardless of what might spring to mind when you think of NYC in the 1900s, the majority of people were obviously not as well off. Hell's Kitchen in particular was one of Manhattan's poorest neighborhoods, mostly because it was near the more industrial part of the island. Hell's Kitchen became a bastion for working class Irish and East European immigrants for decades. The area also became notorious for the purported prevalence of gang violence. But here's the thing about Irish gangs. They have really funny names. For example, the Gopher Gang was a gang led by one Lung Curran, whose friends included Biff Ellison, Goo Goo Knox, Stumpy Malarkey, and Mallet Murphy. <sighs> Out of all the intimidating names you could possibly have chosen to scare your enemies, why the fuck would you call yourself Goo Goo Knox? Anyway, as the 1900s rolled on, Manhattan went from looking like this to this, while Hell's Kitchen remained an industrial, low-rise, working-class neighborhood, but its location would become its downfall. Hell's Kitchen is close to Times Square, it's close to the Empire State Building, it's close to Grand Central, it's right next to Penn Station, and it's on the bank of the Hudson River, the most important river in New York besides Rivers Cuomo. It was unclaimed territory, at least in the eyes of the city government, in the 1970s, New York was in a very bad place economically. In order to qualify for federal aid, the city had to prove it had bold visions for the future. The plan involved rejuvenating Hell's Kitchen, not for the people who lived there, but for whom the city hoped would eventually live there. The plan involved selling off Hell's Kitchen to real estate developers who would develop the land accordingly. The city would then use the profit to build malls, hotels, whatever. However, neighborhood residents rejected the plan. Wearing buttons saying, Save Hell's Kitchen, they protested the city's plan for development of the waterfront, citing the inevitable residential dislocation the plan would cause. I wonder if they turned out to be correct. The only thing the city managed to build was the Jacob Javits Convention Center. The Javits Center is NYC's biggest convention center. It's where they hold Comic-Con, with the rest of the development having been put on hold, the city silently vowed to try again in a couple of decades. That's what they said, I heard them say it. And, due to the protests, a few blocks of Hell's Kitchen were set aside for preservation. But with the Javits Center's construction, landlords all simultaneously had dollar signs appear in their eyes. If Hell's Kitchen were to become a new, trendy, upper-class neighborhood like the plan had promised, they could rake in so much rent money! Landlords were trying to empty their buildings entirely so they could build new, fancier, more expensive housing. All they had to do was kick out their rent-controlled tenants. Here's an example. The Windermere is an eight-story building in the northern part of Hell's Kitchen. In 1980, during the beginning of Hell's Kitchen's gentrification, the Windermere's owner wanted to empty the building of its residence so he can replace it with a fancier apartment complex. 
According to a 2002 New York Times article by Elias Wolfberg entitled Ninth Avenue Noir, the owner ransacked rooms, ripped out doors, and sent death threats to his tenants. The case went to court and tenant harassment was made a criminal offense, because it wasn't one until this point apparently. Even with the new law, the Windermere was still neglected. As of 2007, seven tenants remained in the building, used to the treatment they had received for decades. An additionally fucked up thing is that this sort of behavior never stopped, it just got a little less obvious. This year, a group of Hell's Kitchen tenants sued their landlord for installing an entry system that they needed a smartphone to use. For people of advanced age who had been living in the building for decades, they not only didn't know how to use the app, but were afraid of being tracked by their landlord. In 2015, a Hell's Kitchen landlord left their tenants without gas for months. Roberta Groves, a resident of the building, said, we have fallen victim to his usual pursuit of trying to get rent-stabilized tenants to move. August 2019, a Hell's Kitchen landlord illegally rented out rent-controlled apartments on Airbnb. Personally, all the Airbnbs I use are legally rented out from rent-controlled apartments. New York City, 2012, Olympic Games. They'll have the skill. They'll have the drive, they'll have the heart, but will they have an Olympic Stadium? In 2000, New York City formed a bid for the 2012 Olympics. The plan was to build a big stadium on top of the rail yards behind Penn Station, right next to what eventually became Hudson Yards. New York City never got its Olympics, but it did change a lot of laws in preparation for them. In 2001, the Group of 35, a task force of business and civic leaders formed by Senator Chuck Schumer, released a report concluding that future growth in New York City would be constrained unless new locations were found for high-rise commercial office buildings. The product of that effort was a proposal to rezone a 42-block area of the far west side, which by then had been rechristened by the Olympic bid as the Hudson Yards area. In terms of the volume of additional development allowed in the new district, Hudson Yards represented one of the largest and most comprehensive zoning changes in the city's history. And finally, that brings us to Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards is the example of the New York City government giving corporations the power to bulldoze and terrorize neighborhoods. Gentrification is a group effort. It's the fault of landlords who are willing to fuck over their tenants to make a quick buck. And it's the city government itself that enables the exploitation. Now I know you're all waiting for the funny part about me visiting the funny, tall, cool, shiny buildings, but wait, there's even more bullshit to get through because I still haven't answered a big question. How was Hudson Yards even funded? The buildings themselves cost $25 billion. A lot of that money came from the city, either through direct reimbursements or through tax breaks. The Hudson Yards cost, to be exact, $5,663,000,000 of taxpayer money. <laughs> tax breaks for Hudson Yards ended up siphoning money away from programs the city is underfunded. $5.7 billion is more than 100 times the amount spent on NYC's taxi service in 2018. Bill! The taxi drivers are being overworked! They're dying, Bill! They're dying! New York City also pays its water management employees 1 64th of the tax breaks they gave to Hudson Yards. De Blasio, your corporate dick sucking has given me belly aches from NYC's poop water! New York City gave Hudson Yards a lot of money for absolutely no reason, especially because the huge companies that were moving into the buildings already have headquarters in New York City. So why spend this much money building shit that isn't even bringing new industry? It's just moving CNN from a slightly worse building into a shinier one. Hudson Yards also received $1.2 billion in funding from the city's EB-5 visa program. The EB-5 program lets foreign business people purchase visas for their families in exchange for them putting $500,000 into U.S. real estate projects. The money taken from these investors would then fund lower class urban redevelopment. The program itself is kind of shitty, considering it just lets the rich buy their way into the U.S. and has fallen under contention. But the basic idea, which ends up funding public housing, isn't as bad as it could be. 
When Congress passed the legislation that created the EB-5 visa, it let cities draw the lines however they pleased. Maybe not a good decision, Congress, but good job. So, New York drew the line around lower class Harlem neighborhoods, good, and then continued it down all the way to Hudson Yards. Oops, they gerrymandered it. Nice job. So, money meant for lower class economic development was instead given to the richest of the rich. Funny how that happens. <laughs> Alright, so now, finally, let's talk about what it's like to walk around the new development. Yay, you made it. Welcome to Hudson Yards, home to malls, buildings, and this thing that we'll get to in just a moment. I ended up accidentally visiting Hudson Yards three times. I never spent any money there, but I was there. Once on opening day, March 16th, then twice in September on the 10th and the 16th, both times to see this. When I went in March, the stores were having their opening day festivities! Yay! The mall was pretty packed, although when I went again in September, it was basically empty. Guess people don't like to buy $1,500 shirts in a mall with no parking lot. When walking around, it became immediately evident how this mall was not meant for me. I didn't have a lot of spending money, I just wanted some lunch or something, but even the lunch was expensive. The mall's architecture seemed lifeless and over sanitized. Every store felt like an expensive pastiche of every other store in the mall. And for a mall that claimed to have diverse food choices, according to Ryan Sutton of Eater.com, they weren't very diverse at all. Every restaurant on the fourth floor serves burgers. Seven of the eight full service restaurants serve steak. Half serve the same kind of seafood. But you didn't come to hear me talk about burgers. You came to hear me talk about this, the vessel. Now, officially, the vessel is a sculpture. In practice, it's a tourist attraction. It's 150 feet high and contains 154 flights of stairs for you to climb. There's no destination, just the stairs. The elevator moves at a pace of one floor per minute and it costs $200 million to build. When I tried to go in on September 10th, they made me reserve a time slot during which to enter the building. I think it was because of weight constraints, but it really did feel like they were treating what they claimed to be a public work of art as an owned amusement park attraction. When I came back on the 16th, it was an interesting experience. People, desperate for the fun, light entertainment they were promised, surrounded a glowing blue ring, staring at it. The staircases were normal. Looking up, you might even see your own reflection in the clean bronze above you, making you wonder why you spent six days waiting to enter a building with no purpose. As I ascended the structure, I felt a primal fear of heights I hadn't felt in a while. The glass protection around the edge of the building was only two to three feet high, so it really did feel possible to fall out of. Regardless, I made it to the top, and I saw a view that was both nice and a little sad. Out of a single vantage point, I saw the Hudson River and the rail yards Hudson Yards sat on top of. It was kind of nice. On the other side stood large, imposing buildings, blocking any view I had of the city. It was too tall to feel safe, but too short to feel like there was anything worth coming up here for. As a work of art, the vessel has a point. It's just not the point the creator wanted us to see. He wanted to build a monument, something to be looked upon as a symbol of New York City. What he built was a simple to nothing. The staircases lead to nothing except a view of the buildings that ruined the city they were built in. Being surrounded by staircases, you don't feel like you're in something grand. You feel like you're in something depressing. Like you're nothing except a small cog in a large, meaningless, mechanical nightmare. And that's Hudson Yards in a nutshell. Thanks for watching, everyone. This was my first video, so I know it's not that great, but consider subscribing for better videos in the future. Also, I didn't mention this much because it wasn't really a part of Hell's Kitchen's story, but obviously race-based discrimination is a huge part of gentrification that I'd like to cover someday in a video on its own because it's a big issue and I don't want to relegate it to a footnote of this video. Thanks. Bye.